So yeah, so I'll, I will uh, I will introduce everybody down the row here. This is on my immediate left, left, right, left, is Riona Armasmith. She's Chief Technology Officer at MagniX, the electric propulsion uh, pioneer. Uh, Robert Henning is uh, General Manager at Autoflight, which is the uh, EV toll company. They have their uh, their airplane here at the show. Uh, Jean-Christophe Lambert, co-founder and CEO of Ascendance Flight Technologies, which is the home team here in Paris. <laughs> Got one. Uh, Val Miftikoff, Val is uh, founder and CEO of uh, Zeravia, which is a zero emission hydrogen propulsion developer. And David Chilliday, Vice President, General Manager, Urban Air Mobility and Unmanned Aerial Systems at Honeywell. You're gonna have to change that to Advanced Air Mobility, you know, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> Working on it. <laughs> And uncrewed, by the way. <laughs> While you're at it. We've already made that <laughs> so as you can see, we've got this incredible breadth of, uh, of technologies that are all coming to bear uh, on aviation, beginning at the lower end, but uh, boy, they're gonna have a, an impact all the way up through aviation. So I'm just gonna introduce, talk to get each in turn to, uh, to sort of give us an opening uh, picture of what they're up to. So Riona, talk to us about Magni, Magni X. <laughs> yes, Magni X. <laughs> I always say Magnix and yes. you get my wrist no, slapped. That is not correct. I'm with the little M. It's important. <laughs> so at Magni X, uh, we really we offer electric solutions to the aerospace industry. Um, we've now flown five different aircraft electrically, starting with the uh, the e beaver that you see here in partnership with Harbor Air. So that flies in, in Vancouver uh, and around Vancouver. Um, that started flying back in 2019, and we've been flying it ever since. So we've been flying it for over three years now, um, and we've done, I think, over 80 test flights now on that aircraft. Oh. And so really starting to get a lot of uh, data back from that in terms of um, um, f putting flight hours on the equipment. The second demonstrator that we did was the Cessna Caravan. That was in a partnership with Aerotech. That flew in, in Moses Lake in 2020. Um, and that was, we did a couple of test flights on that aircraft, really showing that it is possible to electrify a large commercial uh, aircraft. Um, and I think that really kind of put us on the map in terms of uh, leading in, in electric propulsion and, and showing that this is really viable on a, on a scale that, that kind of, that makes sense. The next demonstrator that we did, um, we flew in September last year, um, which was with Aviation. So we're the propulsion provider on Alice, which is two of our Magni 650 engines. Um, so that flew again in Moses Lake in, in September last year. Then we moved on to a Robinson 44 helicopter. So you, know, you can see the breadth of the kind of aircraft that we electrify. Um, the Robinson 44 helicopter was down in, um, in uh, Palm Springs. We did point-to-point -point pl flights between Coachella and Palm Springs, you know, 20-minute flights, that sort of thing. Um, and then we're, we're flying with Universal Hydrogen right now, again, in Moses Lake, um, going up to 10,000 feet in altitude on a, on a Dash 8 300. And we have a partnership with NASA, which is our next flight test, which is a, a Dash 7, a four-engine aircraft. And we're replacing two of the engines with electric motors, showing that you could have a hybrid electric aircraft at the aircraft level. Um, so really splitting the, the, the propulsion, the hybridization of the propulsion um, to make it much simpler and, um, and, and really sort of bring it electrification to um, it's, to a, to a larger aircraft in a way that is easy to then kind of increase the level of electrification on that platform if you want to go and replace another gas turbine with an electric motor in future. So in, while this is getting into play, you're, you're also expanding in now into the battery Absolutely. supply, and I think you're looking at fuel cells yeah, as well, yeah, are you? Yeah, so we, we really want to deliver, um, and we see a need to deliver full powertrains to the market. Um, I think it's really important. Um, we've learned a lot from a lot of our flight test demonstrators now and really got a lot of um, learnings back. And we think that we are uh, best place to go and integrate these as, as uh, entire powertrains um, and certify it as well. You know, we, we are the first to have our special conditions agreed um, under part 33 with the FAA for the uh, certification of an electric motor in aerospace. And so really building on that foundation of, uh, of certification experience through to uh, the full powertrain. 
Okay, so then this is ended up here with the, uh, yep. the, the universal hydrogen, um, which is your fir the first time that you were connected to something other than a battery, presumably. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yep, yep. So, so we connect to batteries, fuel cells. We're com completely agnostic. Cool. All right then. Oh, no. Thank you very much. We'll be coming back to you. So, uh, can we? T have you got a video? We we'll have to wait for it to tee up. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. so the Robert Henning. Autoflight. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for having me here um, in this panel discussion. Autoflight is an OEM for eVTOLs, around eVTOL technology. We are currently developing a range of products for unmanned um, cargo transportation on the one hand side, uncrewed <laughs> and, um, and manned um, and flying taxis eVTOLs. And um, we have, uh, we're flying now since one and a half years full scale demonstrators. Um, to prove the viability of um, our concept on the one hand side, but on the other hand side also to develop the technology and the solutions um, in full scale, because you cannot test this in subscale and you cannot prove that in subscale. Um, there are too many unknowns um, in these new technologies, if it's the motors, if it's the, the, the entire propulsion system, um, if it's the loads, the vibrations, all of that. And um, with um, the fourth generation of our proof of concept aircraft, where we're displaying one um, um, during the air show here at our chalet outside, uh, we flew in February um, 250 kilometers um, range, so pure electrical range, vertical takeoff and vertical landing in 250 kilometers, um, to also prove to the um, yeah, to the, to the outside, that this is a real viable um, um, possibility today with current technology as it is today um, to have um, decent ranges already with a non-optimized and non-finally developed aircraft, which is just a demonstrator aircraft. And I think this um, um, is, is important um, for all of us working in this new, tech, in this new environment, um, in, the, in the new industry um, for advanced air mobility, that people can see that this is not science fiction anymore. Yeah, I think it's, it is significant when you get to that higher ranges because there is so much skepticism. I mean, I see it daily with our readership, just don't get electric aircraft. They shouldn't work when you really sit and write them on paper. But if you, but if you can get the right capability, you can find a market where they work. And it's, it's amazing to see you can unlock a lot if you get to 250 kilometers. You know, so. And, and of course, um, um, the one element is the performance, but the other element, it always comes uh, at, the, at, the, at the cost. And um, for us in Autoflight, it is so important um, to bring the total cost of ownership down for these kind of um, um, aircraft. At the end, it's still an aircraft. So um, production cost and, and with that prices, but also operating and support cost. Because only if we're able um, to make this affordable, this kind of means of transportation is going to be accessible to the masses. And then we can scale it and then we can really build an industry around that. If this is going to be as expensive as we did helicopters in the past, we have missed the boat. Yeah. This is not what we have to do. So Jean-Christophe, give us, give us your uh, take on this. Change, this, this sea change in aviation we're going through. Yes, so um, Assonance um, is developing an hybrid VTOL, so what we are targeting is more the alternative to helicopters or what we call advanced air mobility for longer range for right. regional air mobility. Um, the, maybe the particularities we have is we, we invested a lot in the hybrid technology because we are close to be the only one developing it, at least in the VTOL world. And um, we, we saw that this technology has a future for other aircraft, more conventional one. And we decided to, um, to develop it as a product. We call it Sterna. So it's the association of a battery and a turbo generator or a turbine. Uh, it can be also a fuel cell. And we announced this morning um, our first uh, aircraft manufacturer adopter uh, with um, Daer uh, for this hybrid technology. So we are playing the two fields, um, and uh, we are very happy with it because um, there is a lot to do on the uh, hybrid side to reach uh, longer range. So we can reach 400 kilometers range. We can embed five people and uh, at 200 kilometers per hour. Um, the use of aircraft is more people transportation, but also medical services. Right. And uh, today we signed uh, 555 LOI, mainly with helicopter operator. That means we are more betting on the helicopter market than, um, than other market. 
and um, and um, yeah, we are the local one, but um, happy <laughs> to represent the European sector at least, or French one at least. So, are you doing the two in parallel, the e the EV toll, hybrid electric EV toll? A tier and the hybrid electric propulsion system, or are you kind of have you got them staged where you're gonna you get one going and then you, the other one comes later? No, today to be honest, the uh, hybrid technology came later, but today we are playing on both sides because there is a strong mutualization. What we can start to see is um, we develop the hybrid technology for our aircraft and having some um, aircraft manufacturer working with uh, like Daer is kind of. Um, testing more or, or crash testing our hybrid technology because we, we see different ways to use it. We see different ways to integrate it. So I would say it even robustify um, our hybrid technology for the VTOL. But today we are playing on, uh, on the BOSS product. We are not making everything. So for instance, we are buying some electrical um, engine. But what we develop is the global architecture right. and yeah. what we call the hybrid operating system that is the intelligent managing the world system. Right, right. Yep. So Val, you uh, you're actually having a fairly successful show as well. You uh, you announced your first uh, firm, your first purchase agreements this morning, didn't you? Indeed. So I'll talk about that. Uh, hey everybody, Val Metzko, founder, CEO, Zero Avia. Uh, as Graham mentioned, uh, we are a propulsion developer, um, propulsion technology, uh, engine replacements for commercial aircraft. Um, as we think about larger aircraft going longer distances, we think hydrogen is the fuel of choice. Um, and specifically hydrogen electric as uh, the power plant technology allows us to uh, make a conversion of that energy that's stored in hydrogen, which is the best fuel uh, by unit of weight, um, three times better than kerosene in terms of um, carrying chemical energy. Hydrogen electric approach or fuel cells allow us to convert that energy into propulsion in the most efficient way, two to three times more efficiently than combustion cycle, especially in smaller engines. So that combination um, is making hydrogen electric approach the best possible approach for larger commercial aircraft going longer distances. And that's where all of the emissions are. Uh, that's where the entire sustainability challenge for current aviation lies. So that's what we are focusing on at Zero Avia. Uh, we've, um, over the last five and a half years since founding the company, we brought uh, all the key technologies in-house um, we have the high temperature fuel cell development in-house, power electronics development in-house, and the motor development in-house. Um, that allows us to optimize the entire system um, for the applications and deliver the best power density, the best specific power, and um, the best application of the entire technology to uh, the airframes. Uh, with that, we have uh, partnerships with seven airframe manufacturers already for all our segments. Um, we have strong partnerships with the uh, airframers uh, for the first launch uh, in 2025. We have partnership with Textron and De Havilland Canada around um, respectively you know, Cessna vehicles uh, and um, uh, Twin Otters. Uh, for the next uh, um, segment in the large propeller aircraft, we have De Havilland Canada in the, around their Dash 8 airframes. Um, we uh, have around the regional jets uh, with Mitsubishi Heavy Industries regional jets, we've announced um, the results of uh, our work over the last 12 months with them uh, earlier in the show that um, show the viability of uh, our power plant for regional jets as well, which is very exciting because that's where a lot of the uh, applications uh, of our technology and applications in the regional aircraft space uh, lie. Um, and we are uh, expecting to have um, applicability extended to the single aisle and the larger aircraft uh, over time. Um, to date, uh, we've uh, pre-booked uh, about 2,000 engines on pre-orders. And um, as Graham mentioned, uh, we already started seeing uh, people converting that into the firm production slots uh, with deposits um, and booking uh, production capacity uh, that we'll have uh, post our initial uh, entry into service in 2025. Uh, so we just announced today, Monty uh, taking the first uh, 100 production slots, which is very exciting. Uh, for us. Uh, we have partnerships on the uh, fuel supply uh, chain with Shell being a major investor, a number of other energy companies um, as partners on the fuel side. So we've thought through the entire ecosystem to deliver this solution uh, to the marketplace um, in, in its entirety. And that's been uh, quite um, uh, successful for the company up to date and um, uh, we're hoping to continue that in the future. Thank you. So, so David, um 
Uh, Honeywell was one, actually one of the first companies to, to really move in a big way, you know, other than the propulsion startups as, a, as, a, as an established um, company. But Honeywell really was very aggressive in jumping into this market. We, we have, before I go into that, can I just look around and say, is there any more exciting <laughs> industry to be in at this time in the world? This, this is just amazing and I don't know how you don't get up every day enthusiastic about what we're doing here. I think a lot of people in this industry do get up every morning enthusiastic, I think. But, uh. so, so with that, yeah, so, so Honeywell's been around 100 years in legacy aerospace, propulsion, navigation. Uh, about three years ago, we built a dedicated business unit to support UAM and UAS, both to reapply technologies that we had developed in other places uh, to this, this nascent market, as well as to have a dedicated engineering and customer team to serve this market differently. It needs solutions faster, it needs more agile uh, innovation and cycles of innovation, and so we set up a team specific to serve that uh, new market in that way. Also, I think, I mean, you, you were ahead of the curve as well, but we've also seen the industry turn increasingly to companies with certification experience. The supply, you know, there is a lot of vertical integration and that's good, but we see that there's also this reaching out to the industry that does really understand certification. Right, we, we've got lots and lots of battle scars relative to certification, and I do think that's part of why some OEMs have, have reached out to us, is they expect that we can help guide them, even if the technology's new, even if the mission is new, the certification process, we understand and we can support them. And also, I started covering all this, you know, these new technologies, because I was interested in how it would affect the rest of the industry as it as it grew out. And and your kind of product path is is to grow these plant these seeds in this industry, but they go out into the the wider industry as they develop. I couldn't have stated it any better, right? All this innovation, all this um, hybrid electric and electric, all this advanced, more sustainable solutions are going to benefit the next air transport aircraft. It's also going to push for more rapid cycles of innovation. I think the, the period of time between upgrades to, to regional and air transport aircraft are going to have to shorten because folks here at this panel have embarrassed them into moving a little faster. <laughs> So I wanted to, uh, to explore the, the, each of you have different certification, you know, pathways, different certification channels. I just wanted to explore some of those. So, so, so Rihanna, where are you in certification? And, and have, you know, have you, you, do you have conforming engines yet? Or, you know, could you just walk us through where you are in certification? And also, you know, you have this NASA EPFD program, how that's going to help you get to where you want to get to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so like I said before, we're the only company that has special conditions agreed with the FAA in how to actually certify an electric engine. So we are on a path with the FAA. We're working through a lot of the white papers at the minute to actually get agreement from the FAA about how we will meet the special conditions. Um, we've got quite a lot of those back so far. We're going through the software soy processes. Um, and the soy gates with the FAA. Um, next step is moving on to test plans, getting all of the test plans approved by the FAA. So, you know, what does an engine endurance test plan look like for an electric engine? It's very different to a gas turbine, right. and so working with the FAA on, on getting that approved. We're building conforming hardware. Um, so, um, yeah, we're, we're really starting to build the next generation of our technology. We've took a lot of the lessons learned that we've had from our flight test demonstrators and put it back into the design of the, of the electric engine. Um, and now we're building those um, through our factory and all of the hardware is conforming. So we're also maturing as a company in terms of our processes, in terms of um, you know, all of the documentation that's required in order to go and actually produce a, a conforming piece of hardware. And NASA is a big part of that. So we have a, um, um, uh, it's a hundred million dollar program with NASA. It's called Electrified um, Powertrain Flight Demonstration. And really the point of that program is to, to work with NASA and the FAA through what are the key barriers or addressing the key barriers to entry into service of an electric propulsion system. Um, and so really to kind of have NASA at your side as you're trying to you know, work out what it 
what it means, how you are actually going to certify electric propulsion is just incredible. And so really we use that program in order to go and certify, um, certify our propulsion systems. And so we are going to do those, those flight, the flight test program and our certification in, in, in parallel. All right. So Mark, you, you're in an unusual situation, a Chinese startup, European um, operation, and also kind of like an incremental uh, or a stepwise approach to, to entering the market and, and going, going cargo passenger, then global. Could, could you walk us through how, that, how you see that happening? Yeah, thank you. Um, as you said, um, we have um, an, an agreement for the first uncrewed um, cargo um, um, aircraft, which we call Carry All. Um, the G2 equivalent, um, as the Americans would call it, um, was approved by the CAC. And now it's important that we have um, between the CAC, which is the Chinese Certification Agency, um, and the EASA, there are bilateral agreements. So we have an alignment um, in principle on the requirements, but also, of course, um, following the same processes. Uh, so we're going to do the, the carry-all in the first step, then we're going to do um, prosperity in the next step, which is a manned version, and then we're going to go to EASA um, and continue in f closing out the work with EASA. Important is now that um, we have also applied for the um, type certificate um, um, application um, with EASA, and we got that, um, um, that um, approval that we as um, um, Autoflight um, can do this as a design organization together with EASA. Um, and as I said, it's, it's so important to see you know, that um, um, at the end, um, even if it's an eVTOL, and an eVTOL is a real novel configuration, there are a lot of things are new, um, like the propulsion system, we're flying vertically, wah -ha, and we're, we're using you know, full digital um, um, authority, full authority digital flight control systems in there, things which never existed on small aircraft before. Um, so we're doing what you have to do, we're doing what you have to do, <laughs> and everything, and then vertically. Um, but the point at the end, it's just an aircraft. Uh, yeah. It is so you apply standard processes the way you develop an aircraft. We're also going to develop an eVTOL like that. You know, PDR, CDR, the classical elements, uh, you know, the ARPs and all the other things which really work, we're going to apply them there. And, and as I said in the beginning, the important thing is that um, from process point of view, um, these two authorities are aligned. And that, that's an important element for us. So we don't have to negotiate special conditions as maybe um, in, other, in other areas of the world currently. Yeah. So, and also I think what, what, what interested me when you were talking yesterday, you and, and, and Tian Yu were talking yesterday about it, you build data in these, each of these steps. You're, you, you build the cargo aircraft, you deploy the, the cargo aircraft, you get the operating experience, yep. which goes into the certification of the passenger aircraft, which goes into the certification in Europe. And that's something that's sometimes missing in this market, is this generation of, generation of data that's yeah. needed to certify. Yeah, this is absolutely important, and thank you for, for reminding me on that one, is um, when we are going to have you know, hundreds of operations on a daily basis with the unmanned um, variant of our, of our eVTOL, we are learning and we are producing data, and we are producing very valuable data. Um, and uh, a lot of this, um, let's say, it's un un uncertainty, which we see with um, certification agencies, is, you know, they say, everything is new, um, you have to be you know, careful here, careful here, careful here, and which is okay, yeah? because it's all about safety. But um, um, doing um, with a more simple um, operation, with a, with a, with a, with a cargo um, variant, and, and generating data is going to be very important for the, for the regulators um, to get you know, proof of operation um, and that uh, what we developed and what we're um, um, applying in, in, in daily operations is really a safe solution. Right. So Jean-Christophe, where are you? You've got, you've got two certification challenges. Are you certifying um, the aircraft SCV toll and then the, the, engine, the engine is a CS33 or so? Are you, are you doing, or are you doing them together? So, um, first for the aircraft, uh, we are developing under the IASA um, SC VTOL, so that is a mix with um, part 23, some requirement for um, the part 25. So, the, the, the regulatory framework exists uh, since 2019, so we have very good basis of requirement. Now we are um, discussing the mean of compliance, that is a quite challenge because, um, as mentioned, the level of data and real test is uh, for sure, um, more important than in other program because we, we don't have a lot of history in this uh, in this field. And after, there is a lot of work also um, performed with the partners uh, on the electrical engine, on the inverter, because if we put 
all the criteria um, of the, the safety standards. Um, we need also to have a global architecture. It's a complex system um, to be aligned to have a global optimization. For instance, we have a lot of redundancy. What does that mean uh, for each part or some equipment? So I think the, the work is not only um, side by side or, or parties by the party, but globally within the industry. So we have a lot of discussion. So saying that for Sterna, Today, we didn't make the choice, to be honest. Uh, we have a lot of discussion with the aircraft manufacturer right, to right. know if we, they are like willing to have a, a type certificate or they want to, to, to get that on their side. Right. And the second aspect that is key also, a part of the type certificate, uh, I think we are mainly startup ex except only well, um, it's the um, organization, so the DOA right, that yeah. we, we need to, to improve, not to improve, but to develop. And uh, for us, it's also um, key to develop the, the right quality, the standards, the organization to get this um, type certificate and the DOA for us. So Val, you're about to finish your demonstrator flight testing and you then move into the formal certification at that point. So where are you in that? Pre are you going to do that with the UK, the UK and the US? How are you going to go forward? Yeah, so we have flown uh, <clears throat> three prototypes uh, to date. So the largest prototype we're flying in the UK. Uh, we're close to the end of the flight test campaign, uh, about uh, 12 flights or so. We're, um, I think, done nine flights to date um, on a 20-seat aircraft. Uh, the important part about that is the, the engine that we're flying is um, uh, fully uh, qualified for one engine and operative conditions for that aircraft, so we're able to... Uh, uh, finish the flight if the turbine engine uh, on the other uh, side of the aircraft fails at the worst possible condition. Um, so that all allows us to get a um, sufficient amount of data on the engine operation in all uh, um, uh, stages of flight uh, to finalize the design uh, and submit it for certification later this year. So that's the approach. Um, uh, that particular case with the CAA as a primary certification agency uh, with FAA and EASA and concurrent uh, basis. Um, so we got the data from three generations uh, of our technology into that. Um, and it's now working on the uh, uh, certification basis and means of compliance uh, with the regulators. Um, the certification basis side, it's a Part 33 type certificate for the uh, power plants and the STC for the uh, application of the engines into specific airframes and the fuel system uh, adaptation in that. So that's, that's been our approach. Um, so you've just announced the, uh, the Dash 8400 program uh, in Washington State. Is that another demonstrator uh, stage or, or are you going to be more mature by the, you know, when you get that into that airplane? Yeah, so a little bit of both. Um, actually, the technologies that we're using for small aircraft, for Part 23 aircraft and Part 25 aircraft, there are some differences. Um, we think that um, the type of a fuel cell needs to be different for large aircraft and, and for VTOL, for that matter. Um, we have in-house development of high-temperature fuel cells uh, that allow air-cooled, as, as opposed to low-temperature liquid-cooled, that allow uh, significant improvements on the thermal management uh, and significant improvements on the power density specific power. Um, so that's new technology that we're looking to bring to that large aircraft, and um, the Q400 will be a demonstrator for that. We're also bringing um, the uh, next generation uh, motor technology into that, uh, high-speed motors, uh, uh, 20,000 RPM, directly uh, integrated into uh, uh, high-speed gearboxes um, that would drive the larger propellers in those aircraft, and we actually, as part of the uh, unveiling that program, we have demonstrated uh, the full-size propeller uh, operation um, on our ground uh, rig um, right at the uh, uh, Seattle area airport in Everett, um, alongside with the uh, with Alaska. Um, so that is some of the new technology that we'll be looking to demonstrate on that aircraft and um, utilize it initially as the uh, technology development platform and demonstrator. Uh, but then uh, we are of course looking to package it out uh, and uh, bring this as a certified um, uh, power plant for that level of aircraft over time. So, so David, when you're working with multiple OEMs, I mean, are you on different timelines and time tracks, or do you have an internal sort of re readiness? Do you say, I, I, need, I need that ready to be? Yeah, so internally, the technical readiness is something we need to make sure we have available regardless of customer. 
the certification process tends to be customer by customer. Right. And whether it's an avionics system or an electric propulsion system, um, we go arm in arm with those OEMs to assist in them getting the necessary certifications. So um, it, it's not meant to sound magnanimous, right? But our, our cert success is their cert success yeah. right at the vehicle level. Um, but but I have to give a ton of credit, like to the to the folks breaking new ground, right? Magni X and what they're doing on electric motors, um, what Val's doing relative to hydrogen, all um, blaze the trail for those next vehicles that will follow. So so, um, Riona, one of the things that interests me, I mean, Magni X was a real pioneer in this. I mean, I mean, when when it, when they emerged out of Australia with a large motor and then showed that they could put this on a, on a, you know, a real airplane. I mean, uh, the, the, the Beaver was a commercial, is a commercial airplane. I mean, it's a, yeah, and it wasn't a big commercial airplane, but it's a commercial airplane. And then it went on the Caravan, which is, which is, as Val is a target, it's one, of, it's, it's one of the most popular airplanes out there of a certain size. But the technology's keep, keeping moving on. And I, you know, I'm watching all these motor development programs. You know, we're getting to megawatt. We're getting to, you know, talking about two megawatts. And uh, how's, how's that, what's that like for a company that's locked into a certification program, applications? Uh, do you just, do you look at all that technology and develop, say, they've got to go through everything that we went through. You know, it's not going to be, you're not going to be overtaken when this industry is so dynamic at the moment. Yeah, I think, um Look, I think a rising tide floats all boats, right? I think that there's many different options out there. A lot of people trying to do some really innovative things. Um, and I think, you know, all credit, all credit to everyone who's trying to really move this industry in a completely different direction and, and move it towards a more sustainable future. And so what's it like on a daily basis? I mean, we're so focused on certification. Right. right? We right. have to get this certified. We want to get it into service. Um, and so that is you know, the vast majority of, of what we're doing right now is really head down into certification. Because um, I think that, that just unlocks everything else. Yeah. Right? If, you, if you haven't got a certified product, you are not an aerospace company. Yeah. You're just not. Right. And so it's get it certified. And yeah, and, and look, we explore. I think we've demonstrated our credibility in, in this industry. And so, yeah, we get a lot of requests for a, a lot of like, different, a different speed, a different right, power. Right. I mean, stretch it, make it bigger, make it smaller. <laughs> and, and we're saying we're certifying a Magni 350 and a Magni 650. <laughs> and here's the, here's the manual. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so Val, I've, I've, I've been meaning to ask you this. So, so when you, you started, I mean, you didn't, I mean, you bought High, yeah, high Point, you bought the, 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 the high temperature PEM technology, which you were already working with. But to me, looking in from the outside, it all seemed to happen quicker than I expected. We, we kind of went from the, the, the 600 kilowatt size to the two to five megawatt size. It all suddenly seemed to happen a lot quicker. I mean, is that, I mean, on the inside, did you suddenly see attention coming on you and demand coming on you and a need, or was the technology maturing at, to a, at a faster rate that you could get it, you could move into the market more quickly? Hey, it's a little bit of both. So we definitely saw the technology maturing, and uh, there are some of the crossover points between the small engine um, uh, system and the larger engine system as we get experience through uh, the flight testing of uh, all the technologies. Of course, we get the data on the performance. We are able to extrapolate better. And we see how we can scale things uh, better for the future. Um, we also saw the application um, uh, field as well. And uh, with the right timeline on those um, applications, we think we can deliver. Right. So our first application, back to your point on um, the gradual development and step by step, our first application is Part 23 aircraft. We have a partnership with Textron, of course, um, on this. So for all of the uh, segments that we have, we have partnerships um, with the aircraft manufacturers. And that partnership and that certification program will allow us to get uh, all the learnings that we need then to apply to the Part 25 applications that we're looking to bring by 2027. Yeah, so this is a step-by-step -step approach, uh, but you know, technology development needs to start now for 
that type of aircraft because you cannot develop that in, in two years or three years, right? Um, you need a certain technological improvements on your roadmap to get there. Jean Christophe, I'm going to change tack here and just say, as a French startup, what, what's the environment that you're operating in? Like? It, it, do you have a supportive environment? I mean, these guys, you know, the, Val's been very successful in, in, uh, in, in raising funding. Uh, uh, Magniex has got really solid, you know, investment backers. Um, what's it like being a startup in France and, and, and in a country that's becoming very sustainability sort of like focused? I mean, what's, what's the environment like here for you? Yeah, sure. Um, maybe first a comment. I didn't see the, the video, but if you want, our, our booth is just behind Archer if you want to see the <laughs> demonstrator. Um, the beauty of the, of the materials, but um, I think for some reasons, I don't know, um, France was kind of uh, late in creating startup right. and sustainability. Um, on my personal um, experience, I was leading the IFAN projects across the channel from UK to France, right. full electric aircraft, so I, uh, I spent time, but it was um, at Airbus. And, um, and um, clearly, the financing we have in France is not at the same level as um, in the US. But we have um, a strong history. We have a lot of research uh, laboratories. Uh, we have a strong ecosystem. So we try to leverage that to be competitive. And um, I think we are clearly, uh, because today we are really focused to the certification and industrialization. And um, the beauty is to have a um, People like Airbus, like Safran, like Daer, like ATR also to support uh, the initiative is key because it creates clearly a good environment. And um, French president I met yesterday uh, during <laughs> the Paris session announced also a funding plan for France. And um, low carbon um, aircraft is one of the 10 pillars of the vision of 2030 for France. Right. So we have right. support. We will not get all the finance as um, in the US, but uh, we'll play with different, uh, different equipments. So, so Mark, you, you, you uh, I mean, Autoflight started in China, but it has this, this operation in Europe. How are those sort of, um, are you bringing those two cultures together? The, uh, the, the sort of the, the, the very, I mean, the, the, the Autoflight has moved really fast in China. I mean, it's, it's deputized, and then you've got this deeply uh, deep, uh, aerospace culture in Europe. I mean, how is that working when you bring those two together? Um, for for Autoflight, it was important to be um, a global a global brand um, because the markets are all around the world. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to um, um, use the best of the regions we are in. And as you say, you know, the, the, my Chinese colleagues are incredible energetic. Um, you know, there's um, no hurdle too high um, um, to take there. So this is super. And that combined together with, if I may say so, more conservative, very structured, very stringent way of building aircraft, this combination, I think, makes us unique um, in, the, in the market with all our um, colleagues out there in the advanced air mobility. So, David, you said earlier on about the, 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 the more agile, uh, faster turns. Has, your, has Honeywell's in, experience engaging the startups? Is it rubbing off? <laughs> That's a perfect way to say it, right? If, if we are going to do what this set of customers requires of us, our old systems are, are too slow, right? We, we've learned to operate at a pace that these customers want to go. And it was initially very uncomfortable for us. And now it, uh, I made a point earlier about sort of embarrassing those people who still want to go slow. It's embarrassing the rest of our organization that's still operating at sort of legacy pace. So, I want to move to a different to topic here, and not just, sorry, slightly adjacent topic. Um, there are skeptics who kind of look at small aircraft, you know, regional aircraft, um, short haul aircraft, and say, it doesn't matter how clean we make them, they don't move the needle, you know, very much on aviation uh, emissions. But the alternative view is that you've got to start somewhere. And if you can make a difference there, it will move into the other areas. I mean, Rihanna, what's your feeling on? Yeah, I think this is just the beginning. So. <laughs> it's, it, I think there's, there's so much potential for this technology. And right, with batteries and fuel cells, they're only going to improve. Right. right? Especially now with the, the impetus and the focus from aerospace and really kind of 
setting those requirements and saying, hey, look, we have a problem that is different to automotive. Right. right? And so developing the technology for the aerospace industry instead of uh, the, the automotive industry, I think is going to do a lot. Yeah, I think you know it will get to the point where we'll get this into service, we'll show it's possible, and then what can you say? How can you say, okay, um, I'm going to go and fly on a CO2 emitting aircraft after that point? Yeah, yeah. We're just getting started. So, so Val, when you started, was was that single oil and bigger market always in your in your mind, or have you seen the the potential of fuel cells just grow as you've understood them and understood what bringing aerospace engineering to them unlocks? Yeah, it was absolutely um, in our minds from the very beginning, uh, and that's why we we chose the <clears throat> technology set as we did, right, is around hydrogen electric. Uh, hydrogen is fuel. It's basically the way to carry enough renewable energy on board the aircraft, right? That's that's the hydrogen vector, yeah? Um, it's, it's the best way to do it. Uh, you can store even more energy at the fuel system than in the uh, traditional jet fuel airplane. So we get a lot of questions uh, from time to time that, uh, you know, what about the long haul? What about the 5,000, 6,000 cross Atlantic, all those things? Actually, it is easier to store that amount of energy on board the aircraft with hydrogen, right? Yeah, it does take a little bit more volume, but frankly, you know, with the designs of the aircraft today, the volume that's used for fuel is relatively minimal, right? Yeah. If you take the full volume off the, uh, off the aircraft, you know, maybe 5% uh, or so is uh, for fuel. Yeah, more on mass basis, but not that much on the, uh, on the volume base. So if you need to double that volume, it's not a huge deal, yeah? So you can, you can make it work for a large aircraft. And we thought about it from the very beginning, but um, as Rihanna mentioned, we have to um, start with the certified product. We need to certify the first products. That's why we go after the Part 23. We go after the single uh, engine aircraft, small aircraft, that is easier to push through the certification. We can get this in the next two, three years. Uh, and once we have it, uh, you know, there's so much validation that comes with it. Um, and uh, we already, you know, by going through that process, we're getting credibility for the next level. We're demonstrating the technology there. We get more credibility there. We get the uh, people signing up uh, for that. And once we have that flight um, uh, operations on the large aircraft, uh, hopefully already next year, with a full-size engine, you know, capable to carry that aircraft in the, again, one engine in operative conditions, um, we'll get more credibility to talk about single aisle right, and beyond. All right, so I think we're going to wrap up there. I'm just going to say, I hope you're all feeling the enthusiasm that David talked about. It, I mean, you're all doing some incredibly hard work, and I'm sure it's, uh, it, it's difficult sometimes, but it is incredible to, it's certainly enthusiastic on the outside, that's for sure. So will you thank our uh, panel? Thank you very much. David, Val, Jean-Christophe, Mark, Riona.